Well, greetings, folks, and welcome to today's Grower Talks webinar. I'm Chris Beatty, editor of Grower Talks and Green Profit Magazine and the e-newsletter Acres Online, and I'm going to be your host for the next hour or so as we discuss, well, you see it right there on the title slide, new research on overcoming piercing and sucking insects. We're going to explore the details of how those plant pests uh, that operate through piercing and sucking on your crops, and there are a lot of them, aphids, scale, white flies, mealybugs, it's a long list. Well, our experts are going to take you through the basics and the advanced details of identification and control, and we will discuss some of the newest controls, including the new uh, Neonic alternative, Altus. And, uh, well, of course, I am never the expert on these topics. One of these days, we're going to do a webinar that I'm the expert on. But uh, for now, I pride myself in knowing who the experts are. In this case, I've got one from academia and one from our sponsor, Bear. First, let me introduce Dr. Carla Adesso, associate professor from Tennessee State University. Welcome, Carla. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> now, uh, Carla, where are you broadcasting from today? I'm broadcasting from the Otis L. Floyd Nursery Research Center in McMinnville, Tennessee. I bet a lot of folks may not be familiar with that. Everybody knows uh, uh, UT, University of Tennessee, but Tennessee State, you say, uh, is doing a lot of woody research at the McMinnville facility. That's pretty great. Yep, that's correct. We have uh, four research faculty and two USDA researchers here. Beautiful. And a little secret I found out, uh, you are a, uh, a gator in your past, a University of Florida alumni. You got your PhD in entomology there in 2007, right? That is correct. Uh, I try to keep that kind of quiet here in Tennessee because uh, you know, people are not always happy with us, but, but yes, I'm a gator. <laughs> Sorry about that. Go Gators. I am too, in case anybody didn't know. Uh, our other expert, is he's actually going to kind of provide the intro and the, the outro for, uh, uh, for Carla's portion of things. He is Mr. Brian McCaffrey, an ornamentals specialist with Bear. Welcome, Brian. Welcome, Chris. <laughs> now, Brian, you said you have been in the, the plant health chemical business since 1976. That's a pretty long career. Yeah, I, and I feel every day of it. <laughs> now I'm sure it's, I'm sure it keeps you young. And where are you broadcasting from today? I am broadcasting in beautiful, sunny Tampa, Florida. Well, that's why. So we just talked about the University of Florida. You're in Tampa. Uh, I am. Uh, you know, normally I'm broadcasting from Chicago. Today I am actually working the controls, uh, not from the Ball Publishing Broadcast Studios, but from. Um, not so sunny Miami, Florida, from the uh, the ninth floor of the DoubleTree Miami Airport, where I'm attending the PMA Fresh Connections event, doing some grower visits. Tomorrow I'm going to be attending a, a Tropical Plant um, uh, International Expo Planning Committee meeting. Uh, in fact, mark your calendars for January 22 through 24, 2020. For that, uh, and yes, I did get my uh, my chocolate chip cookies there at the DoubleTree. So that's a little bit of housekeeping as we always like to do. Uh, if you have questions as we go along, use the question area that's off to the, uh, I think it's on the right-hand side, but I can't swear to that. Uh, although, uh, Brian, let's see, Bruno just found out, uh, he found out where it is because he's already put a question in there. So you're, you're figuring out how to work it. If the question is pertinent to uh, the topic that Carla's talking about, uh, I will uh, interrupt her and we'll address that question. Otherwise, we'll save it for the end. And if the question is uh, either just too complicated or convoluted or needs more detail or whatever to handle on uh, on the on air, then uh, I will provide uh, information where you can ask it to uh, both Carla and Brian directly. Uh, if you have to leave the webinar for any any reason, we'd hate for it to happen. Uh, or if you want to watch it again, it will be archived at the same place you signed up, growertalks.com slash webinars, and I'll do that as quickly as I can after the conclusion of this event. And I mentioned it once, but I do want to thank our sponsor, Bear, uh, who puts the free in free webinars. All right, Brian, I think I have it all done, so why don't you uh, take it away and give the formal introduction to Dr. Uh, uh, for Dr. Adesso. Thanks, Chris. Uh, as Chris said, my name is Brian McCaffrey. I'm a Southeast Regional Specialist with the Bear Ornamental Team. I represent the states of Florida, where I live, and Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina, North Carolina, Mississippi, and Tennessee. 
I've had the privilege of visiting with the extension office in Minville where our presenter, Dr. Odessa, was stationed. I attended a Tennessee growers meeting there last year and came away very impressed, not by just what Carla and her team are doing, what the entire group of researchers are doing there. I've been in this industry since 1986, as Chris mentioned, and have visited many extension offices in that time, and there are a few that can and are doing for our industry what that Tennessee State office is doing. I highly recommend uh, a visit if you're in that area, and I'm sure they'd be delighted to have you. Dr. Odessa has done wonderful work with Bayer and other manufacturers to bring you the latest information to growers, not only in Tennessee, but across the country. Bayer is certainly delighted to sponsor today's talk, Overcoming Piercing and Sucking Insects, and I'm sure you're going to come away with some great information. With that, I'm delighted to turn it over to Dr. Odessa. Carl, they're all yours. All right, here we go. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I've been introduced multiple times, so I'm not going to harp on that. Um, but I am going to be sharing with you today some insights on what I consider to be one of the more challenging groups of plant pests, and those are the piercing sucking insects. So before we begin, I want to tell you a little bit about where we're going. Uh, I'll briefly discuss how we identify piercing sucking insects if you're not really familiar with uh, how you tell them apart from others. Um, I'll discuss uh, why they're so difficult to manage, uh, how to find products labeled for treating these pests, uh, review some recent pesticide trials we've done, including some uh, trials with Altis, and close the talk with some ideas for best management practices. So let's get started. Um, one of the things, if you are not an entomologist, you probably don't look at insects up close like we do. Um, so to give you a little bit of background on the insects we're talking about today, you need to be aware that different insects have different types of mouth parts, depending on where and how they feed. So we're going to be discussing piercing sucking insects, which includes all the groups of insects that pierce their food with blade-like lips and then suck up the internal juices with basically a straw-like mouth part called a stylet. So the insect everyone is familiar with that has these type of mouth parts is the mosquito. So basically we're talking about plant mosquitoes today. Um, <clears throat> so these insects use their mouth parts to draw fluids from the plants. And one of the consequences of this feeding behavior is Unfortunately, what I call dirty needle transmission. So these mouth parts can suck up viral particles uh, from one plant and then transmit that virus to a new plant when it feeds again. And so for those of you who are familiar with a lot of the more devastating uh, plant diseases, a lot of them are transmitted this way by piercing sucking insects. Now, uh, not to bring keep everything down, we, we wanna say there are beneficial insects as well that do have these type of mouth parts uh, the insect in the center photo is a wheel bug, um, and those use the same type of mouth parts to feed on insects. So there are some, some good guys out there with the same type of mouth parts that are going to eat your bad bugs. So to give you an overview of what groups are included in the piercing sucking plant pest collection, uh, I have a list for you here. Some of these will be familiar to you um, and others less so. Obviously, white flies and aphids can be found in just about every greenhouse system. Um, other insects like scales are probably more prevalent in your outdoor woody ornamental production. Uh, some insects like psyllids and phylloxera, uh, they're rarer problems in production generally, but there are definitely specific species that have large destructive impacts. So in that group, you might think of things like grape phylloxera, which is really a, a large pest of, uh, in the wine industry or age, Asian citrus psyllid, uh, which transmits citrus greening. So uh, when I refer to piercing sucking plant pests, these are the groups that I'm referencing and there are other minor groups that may also appear from time to time. So on to the question of what makes piercing sucking insects so difficult to manage. Now, for those of you who've been managing these for years, you probably are aware that um, these are the sort of the constant and challenging pests often in many production systems. 
so there are a couple of key characteristics of piercing sucking insects that um, make them a little bit more difficult to manage than other types of insects. And the first characteristic is feeding location. And there are a couple different aspects to this. Uh, first of all, if we take the white fly, for example, first, these insects are small. They feed mainly on the bottom surface of leaves, so you're not gonna see them necessarily, especially when they're at low population levels. Um, and then after that, once you know they're there, uh, they tend to be difficult to hit with contact insecticides because they're on the bottom of the leaf surface. And as the, the spray is hitting the plant, it's not necessarily hitting the bottom of the leaves. So in addition to, um, to those types of, of characteristics, there's also the fact that piercing sucking pests will feed on different plant tissues. And uh, this becomes extremely important in relation to pesticide efficacy. So I'm gonna show you right here uh, a very simple diagram of a leaf in cross section. Uh, many of you may have never looked this closely at a leaf either. And, um, but if you look at it in cross section, there are actually different layers of plant tissue there and different insects will feed on these different layers. And I've kind of put some arrows as to where different uh, groups of insects are feeding and what types of tissues they're feeding on. So for instance, if a pesticide requires ingestion to be effective, but the pesticide only sits on the surface of the leaf, uh, or maybe penetrates just a little bit into the leaf surface, into the epidermal cells, it's probably not gonna kill an aphid because the aphid is feeding on the phloem tissue mainly. In contrast, if a pesticide only moves in the xylem and can't move out into the surrounding tissue, uh, it may not be effective against an armored scale, which is feeding on those uh, mesophyll center uh, tissue layers mainly. So in short, where the insect feeds can have a huge effect on how well particular pesticides work at controlling these insects. And that is why entomologists in particular, like myself, really stress the need for accurate insect identification. Um, you know, the bottom line of this is that you can spray a product 10 times with no results if you're using the wrong product for your target pest. So that's something to keep in mind throughout the rest of this talk. I'll probably say it another five times. Another thing that makes these piercing sucking insects so difficult to manage are insect secretions. Now, a lot of these uh, insects are stationary for portions of their, of their time uh, while developing. So they kind of sit where they are, they stick their silet into the plant and they feed without moving. And in order to protect themselves, they're secreting waxes, they're secreting other types of, um, of protective elements that allow them to be a little bit safer from both bad weather and from generalist natural enemies. So basically saying, you know, nothing really wants to take a mouthful of that waxy stuff to try to get at the insect, um, it, except for maybe some specialist predators and parasites. So in addition to these kind of defensive secretions, a lot of phloem feeding insects such as aphids uh, secrete a concentrated sugar substance called honeydew. And that honeydew uh, will often recruit ants to protect those pests from predators. So um, often when on my crops, if I'm looking for aphids, the first thing I see is these ants everywhere that are climbing on my plants for no reason. And they're there defending the aphids because they want that sugar. So that can ha cause um, disruptions in natural population controls, and as well as some biological control programs if you're doing some uh, augmentative biological control. A third challenge uh, with piercing sucking insects is this damage that they can cause to plant tissues. So anytime you have damage that causes leaf curling or gall formation, you end up with this protective pocket um, that is easier for the insects to hide in um, and avoid contact with predators and pesticides. So if you're trying to spray an insecticide that's a contact poison and the aphid is hiding in a gall or is within a, a curled leaf, you're not going to get as good coverage. So this also makes them a little bit harder to manage because you end up with these pockets of reservoirs where there's one, uh, insects that escape treatment and then 
rebloom into a new infestation. So now that we know a little bit more about our problem, um, the main question that we're all probably here for is how do we solve it? Um, today I'm going to focus on pesticide solutions, but bear in mind that these all work best when integrated into a well-considered cultural and IPM program. So while I'm focusing on the insecticides, I'm not completely ignoring all of the other measures that you may be taking in order to manage your crops. So let's start with where you find this information. Uh, you have a problem, where do you find the solution? If you are currently residing in the southeastern United States and you're in the nursery industry, your latest guide um, is this publication right here. It came, is coming out of the Southern IPM Center and hosted on NC State's Extension website. It was put together by a very long list of nursery crop entomologists, pathologists, and production specialists. Um, and reference documents like this can be found on the IPM Center website. Um, for different regions of the U.S. and also for specific commodities and production systems. So if you're looking for a little bit more targeted information, um, I very strongly encourage you to go and follow the links there uh, to find resources. Um, when you're looking for the most up-to-date information on pest management, be sure that it's coming out of a university or state extension office. Um, you're likely to get the most updated and reliable information from those sources uh, in, as opposed to just Googling or, you know, searching uh, general uh, farming websites. You don't really know who you're getting that information from. This information has been vetted more. Uh, in particular, this manual is available free for download, or if you prefer a hard copy, you can purchase one. So what's inside this document uh, is a lot of information and a lot of tables. And the tables are particularly important in helping you identify products you can choose to treat particular pests. So let's take a look at one of those table examples. So here's an example table from the publication I just showed you. Um, you can note uh, on the center section, there's a subheading called sucking insects. It lists all the, these different classes and groups of sucking insects, and I've highlighted the column for aphids just as an example. And what this table will tell you is which insecticide classes are effective against aphids, and it will provide you with some trade names that are labeled for use in nursery, landscape, greenhouse, and interior scapes to treat those aphids. Uh, it is not an exhaustive list, uh, but it is trying to give you some examples of products that are labeled for these uses. So in addition um, to the names of the products, this table will also provide you with reentry interval information. Um, so for instance, if you're treating in a greenhouse, but you need to get back into that greenhouse the same day, you can choose a product with a four hour REI as opposed to a 12 hour REI. Now, my previous comments about the specificity of insecticides for different types of insects, it, you can see illustrated here with all those X's, uh, if you look at the column right next to aphids, aphids which is psyllids, you uh, should note that there are much fewer uh, types of products and classes of insecticides that are labeled for treating of psyllids. So if you were to have a psyllid problem and you were using something that uh, does not work for psyllids, you'd essentially be throwing money down the drain. So this a uh, document with especially these tables is very useful to kind of help you find out what products are likely to work, which ones are labeled, and then you can start looking at what is in your inventory or what products you need to uh, maybe go and purchase in order to treat your current infestation. So where do you find all this information if the product you have in hand is not listed on the table? Well, um, you can find that information on the pesticide label. Uh, this is a bit of literature that comes with the product. It's often affixed to the bottle, or if in doubt, you can Google uh, the pesticide label for every single pesticide that's out there. Um, and you can download it if you misplace it uh, in your inventory. You always wanna read the pesticide label for every product you use. And I have that highlighted 
um, not to be a, a pain, but to because the information in there is there for a reason, and it's extremely important that you are aware of what you're using and how you're using it. Um, when you look at the label, really you want to determine four things. Uh, first, you want to see is your pest on this label? Like, will the product work for the pest I'm trying to treat? Is the use site listed? Uh, as probably many of you know, there are the same active ingredients in different products, and so some of the products are labeled for certain uses, and some of the products are labeled for other uses. And so you want to make sure that not only the active ingredient is one that you can use, but that the actual product is labeled for your use site. In addition to that, if, if yes is for both of those things, um, you also want to look at the environmental and human health concerns, how you should handle it, what your protective gear is, and what your reentry interval is. Again, you know, the, the purpose of the label is to help you use these products wisely, accurately, and to make sure you're not just throwing money down the drain by using the wrong product. Now, suppose you have your pest ID and you have your list of available products. Uh, how are you going to apply this pesticide? Often the answer to that question depends on your particular use site and the equipment and labor you have available. But in general, we have two methods that people use most often, and that is contact sprays or systemic applications. For contact insecticides, generally you're spraying, maybe with an air blast system or some other backpack sprayer, depending on the scale at which you're spraying. Uh, you might be spraying the entire plant. You may be spraying only the foliage, or in the case of wood borers, maybe you're only sp spraying the trunk section. So, those would be application methods for contacts. For systemic insecticides, you're usually applying to soil or container media. Um, in forestry and landscape uses, there are some products that may be direct, uh, directly injected into the plant, um, but that is not as common in nursery production. And some of these products may be even applied through irrigation, whether systemic or via contact um, or through overhead irrigation. So um, this is just basic information about application methods, but um, I want to really focus a little bit, take a tiny detour and discuss systemic insecticides a little more deeply um, to make sure everyone understands how they work, because um, I find this is a little bit more confusing and more complicated than a simple spray and contact and kill. So first off, um, our soil applied systemics are water soluble and they're picked up by the xylem tissue, which is what draws water into the plant and upward to the leaves. Many products that are available commercially stay in the xylem or can diffuse out into surrounding tissue. And there are other compounds that can also move into the phloem, which is your sap um, that carries the, those types of materials through the plant. And that can move in both directions. So it can also spread a little bit further if it can uh, translocate both in the phloem and the xylem. And these products will move up and down through the plant. Now some products, such as abamectin, pimetrazine, and uh, the new butenolide fluparaduferone that's in Altis, they can be applied as contact sprays, but they also have what we call translaminar or locally systemic activity. Oh, is someone? I feel like someone's moving my slide. Uh, yeah, so, so what we call translaminar activity is basically you will be spraying a product, it will land on the leaf surface, usually the upper leaf surface, but the product will diffuse through the leaf tissue and move down into the spongy mesophyll area and down to the lower areas where Let's say, for example, in that photo, an aphid is feeding on the bottom of the plant. Um, it will contact and end up feeding on that pesticide, even though the pesticide only landed on the top of the surface because it's diffusing through the plant tissue. Now, if you have trouble kind of visualizing this concept of movement of insecticide through the leaf, I think it's easier to think about nicotine patches. I think most of us have seen somebody with one of those or some other kind of medical patch that they wear with 
uh, medicine. And the, the concept is very much the same. In that case, the active compound is absorbed through the skin. Um, but the same thing occurs here with these pesticides on the plant surface. Instead of it moving through someone's skin, it's moving through the plant waxy surface. So if you're going to apply a uh, soil applied systemic, there are a few things you need to consider. Um, and again, check the label here. Um, you wanna be sure the product works for the pest you have and for the application method you want to use. Um, and if the answer is yes to those two things, then you need to be sure you have healthy roots. Um, and this is something that sometimes people skip over if they've had some newly propagated material or Maybe they have some plants that are heavily stressed. Um, if the roots aren't healthy and ready to uptake some of that material, um, the product isn't going to go anywhere. It's just going to stay in the soil um, or in the container media. So you want to make sure you've got some healthy roots to, uh, to pull up that product. And finally, uh, you do want to ask what it is you're trying to achieve. Are you looking for emergency fast control or are you looking for long term protection. Um, and this has to do with uh, specifically if you're looking at woody perennials in particular, um, uptake of systemics can take a long time. It could take weeks, depending on the size of the tree, it could take a little longer. So if you want a quick kill of some pest, a contact insecticide may be best. But if you're looking for longer term control, a systemic uh, may be more useful. And again, on a lot of uh, these systemic pesticides, you'll see this little box on uh, uh, of reminding people for applications to woody ornamentals that it can take a little bit longer. So if you have an expectation that you're going to have a problem in a couple weeks um, and you know year after year you have a problem, you may want to apply it a few weeks before that problem appears. And with regards to the question of longevity, you know, how long is long? Um, this table shows how long specific neonicotinoids will last in soils. Uh, this is a measure we refer to as a half-life. So for a product like acetamiprid, um, basically 50% of the product is degraded within one to eight days. Um, with imidacloprid, 50% is degraded in 40 to 997 days. And the speed of that degradation depends on the soil type, what type, and what kind of microbes are digesting the uh, chemicals. So, in short, if you're looking for a short residual product, you want to look at something that has a shorter half-life and something that you may want to have uh, around for a longer time. You're going to look for something that has a longer half-life. And normally, this type of information is not necessarily presented in the label, but what will be presented is your application interval. So if a product says apply every seven days, that is something that is going to degrade really fast. If it says every 90 days or annually, um, those are products that may last a bit longer. So this information you want to look at to make help you make smarter decisions about what products will best solve your specific problem. So uh, systemic products, have a number of benefits as we've kind of gone through for treating piercing sucking insects but they're not without their challenges um, some of the benefits obviously are that you can protect more of the plant if you've got these sprays that are uh, moving through all the tissue if they're translaminar and they're moving into tissue better and treating better uh, without having to have uh, perfect spray coverage um, they're also because they're internal they're less susceptible to uv breakdown and washing off, so they stick around a little bit longer. Um, and they also can be uh, more uh, environmentally and human friendly due to the reduced number of applications that are required and reduced exposure. Uh, if you're applying something systemically, you're not going to have to worry about people rubbing up against foliage and, and contaminating themselves. Um, now, those are some of the, the benefits, but Systemics also, but because of the same characteristics, can have some challenges. And I've already mentioned that, you know, if you're applying a systemic with water drenches, it's, it's just because those products are water-soluble. 
And so we have concerns about water solubility and that you can have runoff with some of these products um, because they do stick around a long time and potentially at sublethal levels, you may see insecticide resistance develop if uh, the plants are uh, treated and the insects are being selected for uh, resistance to those insects. And again, I mentioned it takes a while for some systemics to move through uh, plants, particularly woody ornamentals. And so the timing of treatment and response can be different depending on how fast the plants can take them up and how fast the plants break them down. There's also some concerns about systemics for non-target effects on either beneficial insects or secondary pest outbreaks. A common occurrence that we see often is in the application of imidacloprid, for example, is a secondary outbreak of spider mites due to the positive effect of that compound on mite development. So you essentially you solve one problem and you have another problem crop up. So while we're on the subject of imidacloprid, uh, one of our most popular and effective classes of, of systemic insecticides for piercing sucking insects does remain the neonicotinoids. Um, and I'm sure most of you are aware of the pressure these products are under due to perceptions of danger uh, towards pollinators in particular. And addressing these issues, you know, that's a talk on its own, but for the sake of this talk, I'll simply say that, say that the use of these products has become a little more complicated. Um, however, they remain very effective tools for pest management. So when you're considering using any of these products, you want to always read the labels and follow label instructions to minimize harm to non-target insects such as bees. Um, and if you are concerned or if you're having uh, questions and, and uh, requests from either wholesalers about not applying them or how you're applying them, um, I would recommend you check out some recent work that was completed by several research labs on the attractiveness of flowering plants to pollinators. And some of that information is available on uh, the Horticulture Research Institute web website. Um, or if you want, you can just do a Google search for the document, Plants Bees Like Best. Again, that's Plants Bees Like Best. Um, it is a list of plants with, that kind of rank them for how attractive, attractive they are to bees, and it is recommended to avoid treating the listed plants with systemic insecticides prior to bloom in order to minimize impacts for pollinators. So that's a pretty good resource, and uh, the research on that topic is ongoing, and we'll be hearing about it you know, for years to come, I believe. So now that we've covered some general concepts on pesticides, I'd like to delve a little deeper into which pesticides are most often used for managing piercing sucking insects. Uh, for those of you who need a refresher, insecticides are grouped into classes by their mode of action, um, or in other words, how they kill the insect. That's what the mode of action is. And it's a, a number letter system. And it's important because it allows uh, growers and other pest managers to rotate different classes of insecticides in order to limit the chances of insect populations developing resistance. Um, and as a disclaimer, I do have product names listing in the following slides that represent common nursery labeled formulations, just in case viewers are unfamiliar with the chemical name. I know a lot of people always have problem with remembering which chemical names go with which uh, trade names, so uh, I put some examples up there. And I'll review the next uh, groups a little bit quickly since there's a, a army of documentation out there for you to use to, to learn more about modes of action and product labels all have this information on them. So if uh, you need a, a, a more deeper explanation of some of these, there's uh, plenty of literature out there for you to review. So let's start with group one. Um, group one, A and B are our oldest chemistries. Uh, of chemical pesticides. They're highly effective, but also toxic to humans. So that's why uh, group one is of concern. Many of these products do have danger on their labels and require extra PPE, um, but more recent formulations have been able to reduce 
handler toxicity. So they're safer uh, to handle nowadays, but um, should still be handled with care. And again, always read the label of, of how you're supposed to be handling each of these products. Now, um, I think most of us have probably heard by now that uh, we may be losing chlorpyrifos sooner rather than later, uh, but it does remain a key product, uh, particularly in fire ant quarantine treatment. Group three products are our pyrethroids. Um, there are a lot of compounds in this class, and pyrethroids are uh, generally broad spectrum, but the active ingredients do differ in longevity and on their efficacy on certain types of pests. So um, when you're picking up these products and these labels, be sure you're choosing a, an active ingredient that is labeled for the specific insect that you're trying to target. Next, we have class four, which includes products like our neonicotinoids and our new products, uh, butanolides, which is uh, altus. And these groups are systemic and um, they're very highly effective against our piercing sucking insects. Next, we have a nerve paralytic, abamectin, which is group six. Um, Pyroproxifen group seven is a growth regulator. And pimetrazine is a, a group nine, which is a very interesting product that actually paralyzes the mouth parts of piercing sucking insects. So essentially what it does is it causes the insects to be unable to feed and they slowly starve and dry out. So when you apply a product like pimetrazine or a growth regulator like pyroproxifen, you're not going to see immediate death um, of the insects you know, the next day. You're going to see them sitting there, but essentially they're not doing anything and they're going to uh, slowly die from the treatment. Group 16 is another growth regulator, um, and class uh, group 23 is a fat synthesis inhibitor, spirotetramat, uh, and a newer class of muscle paralytics are the diamides, uh, which are some slightly newer products that have come on the market in the last few years, such as mainspring and acelaprin, which you may be most familiar with. Group 29 is a sensory disruptor, uh, flonicomid. It's actually another rather interesting mode of action. It causes death uh, often from feeding cessation and other behavioral interruptions. It's actually a sensory disruptor. So the insects just kind of become confused, can't eat, can't fly, and end up you know, falling down and dying. Um, and then finally, the last few groups are known as unknowns or undefined modes of action. They include mechanical pesticides like oils and soaps um, that can dissolve insect cuticles or skin and cause them to dry out, as well as bacterial and fungal pathogens that infect insects and cause death by disease. So now that we have reviewed uh, some of the products that are out there, let's take a look at some of these products head to head. And uh, I will start with, um, we're going to look at three different insect pests, uh, crepe myrtle aphid, juniper scale, and Japanese maple scale. Um, the latter two, both juniper scale and Japanese maple scale, are both armored scales. So we'll start with crepe myrtle, uh, crepe myrtle aphid sorry, on uh, Hopi crepe myrtles. Uh, in this greenhouse experiment, we treated four intruded cuttings with altus drenches at the high and low rates uh, and a foliar altus application as well as a contos drench. In these experiments, aphids were able to reinfest the plants from neighboring benches. So as you can see, even at 42 days after treatment, the high drench and altus foliar applications were maintaining adult populations at below untreated and contos treated levels, as well as a slightly lower than the Altus uh, drench low rate. A similar pattern is observed for nymphs, um, except here the foliar application of Altus uh, performed the best out to 48 days.
I want to show you a, a picture of what some of this looks like um, because while the Altus drench treatment, um, you know, worked less well for the nymphs than the foliar application, uh, the level of control they gave was uh, sufficient to prevent foliar damage uh, compared to the untreated plants. Although if you look very closely at that picture, you can see a few little aphid nymphs on the undersides of those leaves. Um, the greater efficacy of the foliar application may be due to that translaminar activity of the product and the slower speed of uptake by the drenches. These were uh, rooted cuttings, as I mentioned, so their root systems were not as strong um, as they could have been, in, and that might have uh, explained why the translaminar activity was a little bit better. In another greenhouse experiment, we looked at juniper scales, which is an armored scale. Um, we treated these with uh, foliar applications of dinotefrin, which is safari, imidacloprid, which is merit, and two levels of altus. Uh, and if you take a look, the uh, safari and both rates of altus resulted in nearly 100% adult mortality by 14 days after treatment. And again, keep in mind, these are uh, armored scales that are not going anywhere except for the crawlers that are hatching. So um, we had adult mortality here. And if we look at the immatures, we see again a similar pattern for the nymphs, though it took a little bit longer to reach close to 100% mortality. And part of that may be because we have a continual hatching of eggs. So even though we've killed the adults, there are still eggs underneath those covers hatching from week to week. Um, these tests and were also, I guess, go ahead. Uh, Carla, when we see the little stars in there, uh, and we saw them on the previous uh, table charts as well, what do those indicate? So those are uh, first to draw your eye, but also to let you know that these treatments are uh, lower than the untreated comparison. Okay. Does that make sense? I think so. Is that like a recommendation? Yes. There we go. Okay, that makes makes it much clearer. Um, so as I said here, we this was a treatment of juniper scale on Angelica blue. We also uh, did these tests on a different cultivar with uh, cultivar with very similar results. Um, so in addition to juniper scale. Uh, my lab has been, done quite a bit of work on another armored scale, Japanese maple scale, um, which has become a problem in the industry over the last few years. So we'll look at some of those treatments. So in this trial, this was actually a preventative trial for container drenches. And uh, we were testing systemic products in hopes of preventing scale establishment in liners. And specifically, we were hoping to identify an additional class of insecticides to use in rotation with neonicotinoids. Um, in this test, we had uh, three gallon red buds that were in pine bark media and they were drenched with different rates of mainspring, acelaprin, uh, mainspring is cyanotranilaprol, acelaprin is chlorantranilaprol, and discus, which uh, the active ingredient is imidacloprid for this, uh, this use. The plants were artificially infested with scale crawlers during the same summer, and then we evaluated them the following spring to see if the crawlers had established. Um, and unfortunately, only the discus worked consistently to prevent Japanese maple scale establishment. We had a lot of variation in the applications for these other products, um, and variation in the up uptake, and it's important to point out that uh, both of these diamide products don't move as well in soil or bark media as imidacloprid, uh, which could explain the large variability in odd patterns that we saw. Um, we're continuing to work with these products to see if we can uh, optimize uh, application to improve their efficacy. So that's kind of on some ongoing research here. We also ran trials of systemic products as curative treatments in heavily infested field production. And again, here we saw discus perform best um, all the way out to 120 days post-treatment. Um, Safari performed well on the first generation of crawlers, but it is a shorter-lived, um, a, a shorter half-life uh, 
Munich. So the second generation was able to rebound because we were in a field that had a lot of crawlers uh, blowing around it. So um, we actually did find in an in additional test that at low population, Safari performed uh, a bit better and was able to knock out populations. Uh, the interesting thing about discus or the imidacloprid treatment was that, you know, we saw that out to 120 days post treatment, we, we were not able to kill 100% of the scale. Um, but when we evaluated those plants the following spring uh, to look at overwintering, uh, we actually found that all of the previously uh, treated trees with, that were treated with discus were free of scale. So it seems to take a little bit longer for that product to, to uh, knock out populations. And uh, from an anecdotal standpoint, a lot of our growers who use imidacloprid drenches for protection against flat-headed borers tend not to have uh, issues with Japanese maple scale, which is why we just tested that product uh, to begin with. I do wanna make a, 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 a little cheerleader uh, comment about dormant oil and uh, propose that everybody use it. Uh, while contact insecticides are available, dormant oil is one of those products that's cheap. Uh, you can use it to knock down your populations of Japanese maple scale. We had about a 75% reduction in live scales by using dormant oil. Uh, it's not going to kill everything and it's not going to uh, stop you from having to use a chemical insecticide if you're having a very large population issue, but it is going to knock those numbers down so that you're starting with a lower population each spring. So I highly recommend you incorporating dormant oil treatments into your production uh, if you are not doing so already. In addition to dormant oil, we tested a number of uh, contact insecticides against Japanese maple scale crawlers uh, in late spring and early summer. Uh, however, the only products to consistently prevent crawler establishment were the growth regulator fulcrum, which is pyroproxifen, and the organophosphate chlorpyrifos, which is in Duragard ME. Um, it's important to note that while both of these products work, the organophosphate was not much better than the growth regulator. And that has a much safer human and environmental profile. And in addition, the, the populations treated with the, the growth regulator appear to have problems reproducing in the next generation. So while there were a few scales that we counted at 90 days, when we went out through the second generation, we couldn't find any scales. So in practice, growth regulators are applied to actively crawling nymphs. Uh, in order to prevent them from molting into adults. So the idea is that you disrupt their ability to grow up. Um, however, these same growth regulators can also sometimes be used to prevent eggs from hatching into nymphs or inhibit females from producing viable eggs. So by applying fulcrum earlier in the spring with dormant oil, um, coverage and penetration of that product might be improved since the plant foliage is not blocking the trunk tissue. And also since uh, Japanese maple scale is a bark feeding scale, it's always hard to get complete spray coverage during the summer um, when these crawlers are active. So uh, we did an additional test uh, hoping that we could treat our trees a little bit earlier in the season with the growth regulator and see a similar effect to this as treating the crawlers uh, during the, the late spring, early summer. And so what we did was, um, this is our first year of data. We're actually repeating this experiment right now. Um, we ap applied our growth regulator in combination with a 2% horticultural oil in mid-March, in early April and mid-April, and those time periods here in Tennessee coincide with egg development and egg laying by adult females. And then we evaluated the crawlers through May, which is their emergence period here. And what you're looking at here is all of the oil and fulcrum treatments were effective at preventing egg hatch, and far fewer crawlers were observed. The blue bars are actually the, the oil control 
Um, so we saw sort of our normal population uh, peak with the just the horticultural oil, but with the growth regulator, we saw far fewer scales. Um, and what, a, the, what we found, which was even more important, is that the crawlers that did emerge in this experiment, um, they uh, did not survive. So by the end of this season, we weren't able to find any scale on the trees we had treated. So we're repeating this treatment again this year to verify the efficacy of this application timing. And if consistent, this treatment method kind of expands the window of application beyond the crawler period for this product. Um, which is a, a goal of ours is that, you know, it's hard to have just one tiny window of application. We want to make sure we have as many opportunities for growers to apply as possible. So in keeping with that goal of increasing treatment options, uh, we also ran a trial to apply chemical treatments in the fall to immature uh, scales heading into winter. Um, and unfortunately, it appears none of our insecticides uh, were effective at killing the scales during their dormant stage, which is not entirely unexpected, but we were hopeful that maybe we would see some mortality. Um, you'll see that there is a, a slight increase in mortality in the fulcrum and oil treatment, but that is due almost entirely to the oil treatment. Um, the mechanical action of the oil kind of loosened those scale covers and many of them dried out. Um, over the winter months. And we know this because the scales that did survive in that treatment um, all were able to molt into the adult stage. So the, the growth regulators didn't, didn't have much of an impact. Um, and so we're going to continue testing Altus and other products uh, during the crawler stages of this summer and in, hopefully in future summers um, in order to find some more uh, optimal times for applying those pesticides. So to wrap things up, uh, I'd like to uh, remind everyone of some best practices for managing piercing sucking insects and insect pests in general. So uh, just a little list of things to keep in mind. Uh, it sort of goes without saying to start with clean material. Uh, this is particularly important with pests such as scales that can arrive on propagated cuttings inspect everything you bring into your facility and uh, make sure you're starting with something clean. If you don't have one, develop a scouting program. If you're not sure how to begin, there's extension documents to help you, your ext extension agents and faculty can help you, and there are plenty of consultants out there uh, that you can hire to work with you on that uh, topic. And Basically, uh, scouting allows you to be more proactive and less reactive to management problems, which is why we recommend it so highly. I also recommend that you maintain pest records with management options. Uh, if you're growing the same plants year after year, you will likely see the same pest problems year after year. Um, so be ready for them. Uh, in addition to providing a routine plan for pest management, this is gonna allow you to react fast if something new appears on the scene. Um, you'll be able to re react fast because you'll know that it's a new problem and not something you've seen before. Um, wherever possible, uh, use preventative technologies or biological controls to prevent pest outbreaks. And this is everything from you know, maintaining the screening in your greenhouses to try to exclude insects. And, or applying biological control products before pest outbreaks occur. Um, the more active you are at prevention, the less disaster management you're gonna have to perform. Now, when you do need a pesticide, you wanna ask yourself all those questions you asked yourself before. Do I need a quick kill or long protection? Are the plants I'm treating attractive to pollinators or not? Um, these questions can help you choose the best products for treating your crops with the least unintended consequences. Um, and you don't wanna have, uh, be solving one problem while creating another, essentially. And always, always, always remember to rotate your chemical modes of action and not just active ingredients. So in other words, rotating between pyrethrin and bifenthrin is not rotating. Um, you're gonna cause more problems for yourself by relying on the same products year and year again. So you don't want to select for resistant populations. And finally, 
Um, in addition to considering your specific problem of the day, it is important to determine if other IPM practices will be disrupted by a pesticide application. And in particular, let me see. In particular, if you're using biological control products, um, you want to make sure that you are using these as preventatives. Um, most biological control products are designed uh, to work well as preventatives, not to be used when you already have a disaster. Um, and if you do find a need to apply a chemical treatment, choose a chemical that is compatible with your program, or if none exists, know how long you need to wait post insecticide application to reapply your beneficials so they won't be harmed by your chemical treatments. And if you're ever in doubt of any of these things, the suppliers of your biological controls often have this information on pesticide biocontrol compatibility. So you can ask them for guidance. Um, and if the information is out there, you know, definitely use it because you don't want to waste time and money on either beneficials or pesticide applications that are going to interact poorly. So that's my, my little uh, plug for your biological control and integrated pest management uh, programs. So uh, to conclude, as challenging as some of these piercing sucking pests are to manage, um, the good news is that you actually do have a lot of tools out there available to you. So um, the trick is to figure out how to use them wisely together to get the most out of each one. And with that, I'd just like to acknowledge everyone in my lab who uh, worked on these projects, as well as my funding sources. And I want to give a special thanks to Bear for sponsoring this talk and Grower Talks, of course, for hosting the webinar. And uh, with that, I'll thank you all for your attention and turn the mic back over to our moderator. All right. And Brian, you're going to give the last words, I believe. I am. Thank you. Um, again, on on, on behalf of Bear um, and certainly uh, Carla Adesso and, and for giving us for, for giving us a chance to do this webinar, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, Bear Bear does offer three very distinct uh, products that kind of fit into what Carla was talking about. Of course, you heard about Altus, you saw a little bit about Contos, and we have a product Sabat. You can uh, find out more about those products at that website down there below, bear.us.productionornamentals, um, to learn more about them and pick up labels. If you have any questions about any of these products, feel free to reach out to us. Um, my email is brian.mccaffrey at bear.com, or you can go to that website and you can find out who the representative is in your area to, to find out more information. Um, but again, it's been our distinct pleasure. There are there are going to be um, – there's three going to be lucky winners of drawing our registrants are going to receive a free bottle of Altus from this webinar, so good luck to you. And again, it's been our pleasure, and thank you so much for uh, for joining us today. All right. Thank you, Brian. We do have a few questions that have come in, and interestingly, they were, uh, two of the three were uh, were really related to uh, what, you had, what you were talking about at the very end, uh, biocontrols, Carla. So let's see what you could tackle here. Sandy wants to know, uh, if you can advise uh, or offer any advice about the use of uh, mycoinsecticides like Botanigard or no fly while using uh, beneficials, um, is it possible to use both without harming the beneficials? And uh, what, what might you advise there? Well, um, one of the things that I would advise you to do is uh, there is a the International Biological Control Organization that has a website. And on that website, they have resources for those products and using them with beneficials and sort of timing wise and how well to use them. Um, I want to say that some of those products, if you're, for instance, if you're using uh, predatory mites, uh, you want to make sure that the product you're selecting is not going to kill mites. Uh, if you're using a parasitoid, you want to make sure that they don't have a label for wasps. So some of these products actually are, are pretty safe for some of them, uh, the beneficials, but they may not be as safe for other ones like a, a, a beetle that is a, you know, a lady beetle, for instance. So um, there is information available out there on those interactions. So it's, it's going to be a matter of taking, you know, which active ingredients in these uh, biocontrol uh, entomopathogen products and making sure that they're 
going to be safe for the particular uh, insect biocontrol agent that you're working with. All right. How about uh, Donald wants to know, how about Altus drenches and beneficials? That's a good question. I have not specifically interact, done any interactions between Altus and beneficial insects. So we might want to ask Brian if they've worked on any of that specifically. But um, the first uh, person I would ask is whoever is selling your uh, beneficial insects. Or if you're getting them from a, a larger company that has some insecticide uh, compatibility trials, that would be the first place to start. Um, or to ask Bear if they have done some of those trials as of yet, um, because there are a lot of beneficial insects to um, to do trials on, and so it would probably depend on which beneficial insect you're working on. Please. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, great point, uh, Carla and um, Chris. To that point, um, Bear has done a lot of research when it comes to both foliar and drenching applications of Altus with beneficials, it really does depend on the beneficial. Um, we have a list of those things and, and you can go online and ask for those or you can send me an email. My email will be coming up here in a second again. You can send me an email and I could uh, certainly forward any information we have to that effect to the, whoever's asking that question. All right, very good. Uh, Carla, Bruno wants to know what, uh, what do you think about the use of uh, pheromones to control uh, sucking insects, thrips for example, uh, and what strategies do you recommend with them? So I guess it would depend on, are they doing this in greenhouses? Are they doing it in, you know, in field? Um, in general, you need to make sure, the first thing is you need to make sure you know what species of thrips you're working with because every insect species does not necessarily have the same pheromone. Um, if there is a program for, you know, Western flower thrips, that is being used as a, an attracting kill, they can be a very good uh, IPM augmentation uh, for managing those types of pests. Uh, I would definitely say that anything that you can use to keep your populations below economic thresholds is a good plan. Even sticky cards that are blue that you know some thrips like to uh, like to be attracted to. Um, but as with all of the behavioral modifications. Uh, such as pheromone use and things like that, um, you know, you have to consider that the goal of the insect is to eat and reproduce. So you're going to get some on your plants, even if there is a pheromone attractant, because they have to eat sometime. So it may be something that can uh, be used as your first line of defense to keep your populations low. Um, but do consider having some options available that you feel comfortable with when your populations get a little too high and those behavioral management strategies are, are you know, maybe not holding up to the level that you want for uh, <coughs> sale of your products. Uh, so, if, so if you've got uh, zero tolerance on your crop, uh, then that may not be the best the best right. choice for you, or certainly have some backups ready. Uh, Elaine wants to know how about recommendations for preventative when you're uh, on uh, on vegetative material before planting. I guess I'm not really sure what the preventative. Uh, pre uh, pre so yeah. So how would you treat a uh, say a rooted cutting or something before you plant it? Okay. Uh, or would well, you not do that? Well, it, I think it depends on what you're treating and what the labeled, uh, what the product label is. There are some products that are labeled for dipping of, you know, cuttings um, that can be applied. Either you can dip the roots for a systemic treatment or dipping the foliage um, prior to, to um, lining out the, the plants. And if it's on the label, then you can do that. Um, but those are uses that are often kind of not on the labels. Um, so if you're putting them into containers, I would wait until you're treating the containers or in the field. But if you can find a product that is labeled for dipping, I mean, that would be a, a very good way to, to do things faster. Um, because, again, when you've got a bundle of, of cuttings, it's easier to dip them than to have to spray each individual one in the field. All right. Uh, Sarah wants to know, what are your thoughts on microbial insecticides? 
Well, we're actually doing uh, quite a bit of work on microbial insecticides for uh, spider mites and aphids. Um, again, those products really, they're great before you have a huge outbreak um, because they're not fast acting or as fast acting as some of, some of the chemical insecticides. You're going to end up with a level of damage to foliage um, that may or may not be acceptable to you. I think it depends on what you're growing and how soon you're going to be selling them. Um, but when you establish uh, biological pesticides, often you can keep those population levels below, um, you know, outbreak levels and certainly below, you know, damaging levels in which you're going to see a uh, loss of growth. But it will depend on what pest you're talking about. And again, the crop life cycle. If your concern with, is with woody ornamentals that you're going to sell once they've dropped their leaves, um, you know, you don't have to worry about that, the aesthetic of, the, of what the foliage looks like afterwards. But if you're talking about, you know, bedding plants and flowers, the, you know, the, the level of physical damage you can uh, sustain before somebody's not going to purchase them is going to be a lot lower. All right, just a couple more. Uh, Linda wants to know one more thing about Altus. Is it a translaminar? Uh, I, I believe so. Yeah. Said. yeah, it is. Uh, Brian, you want to back me up on that? Yeah, it is both translaminar and it also is a xylem systemic, so it moves up through the soil and making a great metabolic. It has yep. both, both activities. Very good. Uh, and uh, let's see, Nate wants to know, how do we get that free bottle again? Well, Nate, you are registered for a drawing. I think you said three three bottles. Is uh, Just by registering for this webinar, you're in the drawing to get one of uh, three free bottles of, uh, of Altus. And uh, Patrick uh, has a question, and I'll get to that one in a second because he wants to know about the slides. But let's, let's address this. If you've got more questions, and a couple more coming in last minute, but we really got to go. So if you didn't get your question answered, or if you come up with one if, uh, as we go along, you can email either uh, Carla or Brian. Here are their, their email addresses. They promised they would answer 24-7. That's how into this they are. Uh, well, okay, maybe not after midnight, but there you go. There's the two email addresses for both of our of our experts today. If you want to uh, relive the webinar, and that's where we would we don't have the actual slide deck, you know, the PowerPoint available, uh, but you can watch the webinar again. Go back through every slide, study it uh, carefully. Uh, it will be at the same place where you signed up, which is GrowerTalks.com/slash uh, slash webinars. And that should be posted within, uh, oh gosh, an hour or so of what we're doing. And again, thank you very much to uh, to Bear for sponsoring this webinar and putting the free in free webinar. We couldn't do it without you. So that said, I want to thank uh, Carla and, and uh, Brian for the presentation today. And on behalf of Carla and all of her smart colleagues at Tennessee State University and Brian and all of the generous folks at Bear and to all my staff at Ball Publishing who work hard so that I can travel to places like Miami to do webinars. This is Chris Beatty saying so long, everybody.